Welcome back. It is time again for Silver and Black today, an Odyssey Sports original podcast covering your Las Vegas Raiders. Thanks for being with us. If you don't already subscribe to the show, please do so wherever you get your audio. If you're watching us on YouTube, we would appreciate the subscribe. And don't forget, hit that notifications bell. You are with Scott Branson and Mo Moten. Mo is a senior NFL writer at Bleacher Report. He also covers the Raiders uh, for sportsnot.com, where you can also catch my work on the Raiders and other things. You can follow him on x.com at Mo Moten, M-O-E-M-O-T-O-N. I am at LV Gully, the show SNB Today. We're going to get into some Raiders news. There's not a lot of it. Yes, they're in week two of OTAs. And Mo, you know, there's this, the commissioner's floating out there, this 18 game schedule, which we all know is going to happen because it's called money. And one of the things that they're talking about is the fact that the players association get rid of the, the, the preseason games, you go to 18 games, but then you'd also have proposal says you'd have longer periods of off season workouts, which the players are in favor of kind of, but not in favor of kind of. It's such a weird time in the NFL with the schedule thing now to go to 18 games. The schedule will get all changed if we move forward with that. Yeah, so Albert Breer had a post on X and he said some players and coaches aren't too happy about it simply because the way the current offseason aligns with their kids' summer vacation. Yeah. So NFL players break off mid June and they're not back till late July, early August. And that perfectly aligns with some school schedules. Different here in New York City, kids get out in late June, come back September, but whatever. But um I, I could see there being a little pushback, but it I, I think it's good for selfishly media content uh creators like us because after the draft, then you would get a break in May, basically a full month of break in May, half maybe half of June. And then you just start off, you know, the second half of June and you ramp up up until week one of the season. So for for media people like us who breathe into a microphone, great. Not so great for maybe the the actual football folks who have to go to work, coach, play uh, the game. So we'll see what happens there. But as you said, we we already know an 18 week, uh, 18 game schedule is coming. It's just how are they going to uh, configure the, the offseason around that schedule? We'll find out. Yeah, and I, I, I've seen some people say, well, that's just too much football. But ratings, Watch. ticket sales, yeah. merchandise, everything says no. People want more. And 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 let's face it. We sit here during almost June now. We're, we're two days away from June. We're on May 30th on Thursday. You look at it, and really coming up, once the NBA and NHL playoffs are over, and, and we know NBA, NHL, not as much interest in those sports as football, of course, uh, it's it's dead time during the summer. So if people could have more football, meaning that <clears throat> the year actually starts for these teams in June, then suddenly things kind of accelerate. You have more to talk about. You have more to do. So it's going to be interesting. But until we see a fall off in ratings or something like that, which you're not going to see, I just don't see it happening, uh, it's going to continue to go that way. So it'll be interesting to see what happens with this new proposal and how they come about it because they got to negotiate on it it's not part of the the uh, bargaining agreement because it's new and so the owners know they have to give something although the owners have all the control because remember for each of these guys that means it's another game pay it's another day of game pay so you get another check uh and and while yeah if you're one of the top paid players in the league you're going to get a lot of money anyway but for the average everyday nfl player the median guy it's a big deal it's absolutely a big deal, but what I'll say about people who are, I guess, against the 18-game schedule, look at Thursday Night Football, right? Every every day, every Thursday when I'm online, even in the offseason now, people complain about how bad the product is on Thursday Night Football, but they still watch. They still watch. So, so if you complain, now I get for media people like us who have to because of our jobs, it's a different mm -hmm. story, right? But if you're the average viewer and you don't like certain part of the product don't consume it because when you consume it whether you complain about it or not you're going to get more of it because that's all that matters is the viewership so if you yes. if you the more people complain about it and talk about it but still watch 
it's a wash and you're going to get more football, as you said, and, and it's, it's season's only going to get longer. As you said, the, the player, the average player probably likes that extra game check. Uh, the, the 35 year offensive tackle <laughs> who's, you know, already been paid and been paid for years, probably like, ah, I'm not too thrilled about it, but you know, what's going to happen, right? Scott with an extra game, more players will take days off if they're nicked up, especially early or middle of the season. If it's a playoff team and they need their star wide receiver for the playoffs, they'll give that guy an extra week or two off, and that's how it balances out. Right, and they, they obviously need to have a second bye week, right? I mean, to yep. me, if you're going to go 18 weeks, you're going to have to have give each team a second bye week. And then the Thursdays, do Thursdays go away, and do you start thinking about Fridays, or do you think about – uh, extended Mondays again. I, it's hard to do a national game twice in in one night like they did on Monday night at the beginning of the season because you have East Coast time and Central time zone. Yes, if you're on the Pacific time zone like a lot of Raider fans are, that's great for you to get two games, but for most people, they don't see the second game. So it'll be interesting. I don't see Thursday night football going away necessarily, but I'm sure they're going to try to figure out a way to extend the calendar so that the the, the, the time off between games – scheduling wise is advantageous especially because a big concern here is injury mo you talked about it just a second ago and that's where i think guys really think about it. it's like you're 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 going to shorten my career by adding you've added one game now you're adding a second game and so my career now for every five years i play that's almost an entire another season on top of it i think we're headed toward double headers on my name football as a norm simply because yeah. If you look at the schedule this year, there are multiple weeks where there are double hitters on Monday night. And I think the NFL experimented with it with the with the first week of the season over the past mm -hmm. few years. And like I said, they've sprinkled it in throughout the year this upcoming season. I think we're headed to, you know, more primetime games. And as you said, every team, I think in fairness, every team should get an early buy and then a, a late buy. So that now you're you don't you know you don't have to worry about oh is the buy early is it buy late now you have 18 games but you have two buys one in the first nine you know nine ten weeks of the season and one in the last, back end of the season and you can actually move so so that the East Coast the first game of the day if you do double Mondays you can start at 7 p.m. Eastern which is a little earlier because out here you know we get games starting at nine so you start a game at seven that's five in Central time zone which is people are getting off of work so they want to go to the local sports bar they want to go home and watch the game those of us on the east coast the game's over by 10 10 30 and it's not one o'clock in the morning and then for the west coast you have the second game obviously you're going to have it west of the central time zone mountain time zone pacific time zone and they get a full game when they get home from work at five or six o'clock not having to uh watch a game and rush home and miss it because it started earlier so it makes a lot of sense from an entertainment perspective. So we'll keep our eye on it. It'll be fascinating to watch what happens there. Uh, Mo, in Raiders news, I mean, not a ton of stuff. You, know, you commented on X.com, and I started laughing. I was eating my breakfast this morning and saw you talk about, hey, don't take too much out of OTAs. People are going crazy. They're seeing people post things and all this. It's like, oh, no, it's just shorts. It's helmets. It doesn't mean that much. But one of the things that I saw today, and you talked about, uh, Albert Breer uh, posting something, and uh, Warren Sharp from Sharp Football posted this one, which relates to the Raiders, which I thought was interesting, and I want to get your comment on this. The most expensive wide receiver rooms for the 2024 season, San Francisco's one at $55 million, and the Raiders at number six with $42.1 million committed to wide receivers behind Chicago, Miami, Dallas, Seattle, and said 49ers. Uh, when you look at this, what, what popped in my head when I saw this, and I want your reaction, is you see that figure and you say, okay, we talked about expectations with Luke Getze. We talked about expectations with this Raiders team. With that kind of salary going to that wide receiver room, knowing that you have the quarterback situation you have, if you're Tom Telesco as a GM, and I want you guys to all remove your emotion for a second. This year, we talked about it last show about Devontae Adams. This year, if they don't come out and do really well, um, you're spending a lot of money on the wide receiver room, and I know where it goes, primarily Devontae Adams and Jacoby Myers. But you look at that, and I don't know that that's sustainable if you don't see incredible results. So I think the pressure's on there for not only the wide receivers and Luke Getze, but for Antonio Pierce, too, when you look at this offense going into next season. 
Yeah, I talked about this on Wednesday during my Bleach Report Live that the pressure, yes, is on Luke Getty to be creative with his with the, with his offense. But with the Raiders spending so much on it, you know, you, you have to figure they got, they're going to want a quarterback who either A, has some upside in Aiden O'Connell, or B, is an experienced veteran. So this is why Gardner Minshew makes sense. Let's make the best of what we have because we're mm-hmm. spending so much on our wide receiver core, our pass catching group. That's where Gardner Mitchell comes in. That's where Anthony Brown comes in. Doesn't have a ton of experience from Baltimore, his Baltimore years, but he's played in some games. So this is why a lot of people have asked me about, you know, what about Carter Bradley being the undrafted rookie? You know, what are his chances of actually playing in a football game this upcoming season? And I said, one, it's hard for undrafted rookie quarterbacks to even play in a game, let alone start one. Two, do you really want to throw in an undrafted rookie quarterback Unless he's earned it, of course. Do so you really want to throw in a, an undrafted rookie quarterback in there with Devontae Adams, Jacoby Myers, guys who are in their prime years, while this team has a team that's not – it's not a rebuilding squad. Mm-mm. You know, it's not like the – this is not like the Patriots and the Commanders where you have a bunch of young guys and a bunch of culture-setting culture veterans there to help the young guys along. This is a team with multiple premier players or starting players – in their prime or on the back end of their prime, Devontae Adams, Kobe Myers, Max Crosby, Robert Spillane. Do you want to waste another year of these guys' prime, you know, optimal years with a quarterback situation that's not optimal? And it has to match. The timelines have to match up. And this is goes to, I guess, next year. Let's get through this year first. But let's say the Raiders are, you know, in anywhere between eight and nine wins, seven and nine wins. You know, they're they're probably gonna approach Devontae as about a restructured contract because his you know his cap is gonna go up astronomically next year. And they're gonna say, Well, Devontae, we got Devontae Adams still here, Jacoby Myers still here, Brock Bowers growing, Michael Mayer growing, Trey Tucker hopefully growing. Mm-hmm. What are we going to do at the quarterback position? We have to be aggressive because we missed out in 2024. <laughs> we restructured Devontae Adams, hopefully to keep him. We have to go hard at a quarterback if if a O'Connell and or Garner Minshew aren't the answer. Right, exactly. So, I mean, that's that's what I look at too, but I, I just think that that number, I think I knew that number, but then when I saw the post and I thought, wow, six. And this is not, everybody's got to take this the right way. This is why, to your point, not being a rebuilding year per se, right? Not They're not a rebuilding squad. That means everybody. I'm not talking about just Antonio Pierce. I'm not talking about just Luke Getzey. Everybody's under pressure. There is no... There is no mulligan year. There is no give me year. If they go out and win five games, I think everybody's in trouble. I really do. Because now injuries can change things. Things can happen. I get that. That's that's the caveat. But I think to your point, you picked them in your initial selection as eight wins. I think eight, nine wins. A lot of fans think they're going to win 10, 11 games or more, which would be great. And if that does well, awesome. Everybody's feeling good about it. But I just think with the dollar figures and with the makeup of the roster, like you said, sans the quarterback, then they're going to have to come out and perform. Like I said, if they do well, they miss the playoffs because they win nine games or they win 10 games. That's one thing. But if something goes south, um, I don't know that you can sustain it with what you have there. I'm not saying Max Crosby, any of those guys, but a Devontae Adams, as you talked about, those are the type of things you're going to have to look at if you can't get over the proverbial hump this season. Right. So let's say everything does work out. Let's say the Raiders win 10, 10 games. They go to the playoffs. Then there's always ways to restructure deals. As I talked about, yeah. Devontae Adams would be a prime candidate for that. And then the problem is out of the window because if you win 10 games, chances are your quarterback position wasn't terrible. Mm-hmm. You got That means you probably got serviceable quarterback play out of Garner Minshew or, and or Aiden O'Connell. That doesn't mean you don't draft the quarterback still. In, the, in 2025, but it means that you can get by another year with a high price offense saying, okay, we got something here. We started something with Luke Getze, and it can only go up for here, you hope. But winning would solve all of these question marks that we have. And <laughs> fortunately, you know, it's, it's late May, early June. All of these are just projections. We don't know what's going to happen. Of course, the, the Raiders... I don't want to say desperately, but they need a winning season. I don't think they do. if the Raiders, let's say the Raiders flop, I don't think Antonio Pierce gets fired simply because if you're Mark Davis, you don't want to keep turning over the coaching staff every one to two years. I, I think he has a decent runway where even 
regardless of what happens this year, barring the team turning on him, which I don't see happening, he's going to be the coach in 2025. It's how are you going to restructure or configure the roster based on the results of the 2024 season? We'll find out. Correct. And I agree with you. I don't think I don't think there would have to be something crazy that happens for Antonio Pierce, no matter what happens this year. Um, uh, to, to not be there for a second year as a full-time head coach. I agree with you 100% on that. All right, before we go to a break, Mo, and then we get to some callers and some text messages, we got some shy people who texted us this week, so we'll get to those. Um, but but one of the things that, that I wanted to talk about, too, with the Raiders was the quarterback thing because, you know, we talked about Trey Lance because another journalist wrote a piece on it. That's why we talked about it on the last show. And I am I'm really surprised by, and I'm not saying, and because because I think that this gets mer- mischaracterized sometimes from our show, which is we've never said nor are we saying that Gardner Minshew and Aiden O'Connell can't do well this year, right? None of us said that, but what we have said is that long term solution, not the solution, right? So Aiden O'Connell, there's some people who believe he's going to suddenly become mobile, okay. Now, he can get better at being mobile, no question about that, and I wouldn't say mobile. He can get better at moving within the pocket, creating with his legs a little more. That's limited, though. God made you who you are. You can't suddenly become uh, somebody you're not. But he can work hard, which we know he is. He's a nice young guy. He'll do it. We know what Gardner Minshew has. And so I look at that, and I see people talk about, well, we don't need a quarterback. And I'm telling you, I'm listening to – podcast with Brian Baldinger, our good friend who comes on the show. By the way, Brian and Baldy, he'll be back uh, right when we start training camp. This next time he'll be on the show. But he's on another show talking about, and they went through the teams, and they got to the Raiders. And you know how much he loves Max Crosby, how much he loves what the Raider defense is doing. And the host asked him, so what do you think? You think the Raiders got better? Are they going to get improved? And you know what his point was? He immediately said, they didn't figure out the quarterback. They didn't figure out the quarterback. And so in this business, you have to figure out the quarterback in order to get to the next step. Now, next step to him, I think he was talking about being a true championship contender. So I know some, you know, Baldy's a good guy. He's not one of these guys that you guys paint as anti Raider. He's not that way. He comes on our show all the time. You know what he talks about. So you look at that. And and to your point, you talked about, hey, if the Raiders win 10 games, go to the playoffs. That means the quarterback play was good, and they got there, no matter if it's O'Connell or if it's Minshew, whoever. That does not mean you don't be be aggressive next year to try to go get a quarterback if the one you want is available via trade, free agency, or the draft. Absolutely. Uh, But what I – what I because I don't want to beat the quarterback discussion to a bloody pulp here, but um, (laughs) – One point that I did make on my Bleach Report Live on Wednesday that I didn't raise on the show is that I'm I made a take I had a take that I think Aiden O'Connell and Gardner Minshew are both going to start for the Raiders this upcoming season one way or another. Saw whether that. it's injury or performance based reasons, I think they're both going to start for the Raiders this upcoming season. The other thing that I hadn't thought about before uh, I got on that Bleach Report Live that I did mention on the show is that. Let's remember that Aiden O'Connell played the Chargers twice last year. His first start and his best start of the season were against the Chargers. I know the Chargers have a new coaching staff, but a lot of those guys on defense are still there. The Khalil Max of the world, the the Derwin Jameses of the world, a couple of the DBs are still there. The Chargers still have some of the same personnel they had last year. And the Raiders get the Chargers in week one, the season opener. I think that helps in uh, Aiden O'Connell's case. If the if the race is close between Aiden O'Connell and Gardner Minshew, and you're deciding, okay, it was the even quarterback battle, who do we start? The guy who has more upside and is younger and has mm-hmm. played against a lot of these Chargers defenders twice last year and played very well in the second game, or Gardner Minshew? I think Aiden O'Connell will get the nod if that is the case. If it's a close battle, if Gardner Minshew doesn't clearly beat out Aiden O'Connell. Uh, in this quarterback battle, Aiden O'Connell, having seen the Chargers defense, at least some of it, twice last year, I think bodes well for him. And I I, th- I think you're thinking of sound there. And I think that also factor in, because I do believe, I do believe, I listen, some of it is is for show and some of it is for mood. But I do believe in my heart of hearts that 
Antonio Pierce is that loyal guy. He is that guy. I think he's very authentic with that. And I think it's going to take something, Gardner Minshew showing something incredible for him to move past Aiden O'Connell to start the season. To your point, though, we'll see. If they struggle, if Aiden O'Connell struggles, then you could see Minshew. That's why you got a guy like that. So we'll see how it all ends up. But we'll talk about it, I'm sure, as we move into the future. All right, we're going to take a break. When we come back, the rest of the way, we're going to do some phone calls and some, uh, what are they called again? Oh, yeah, text messages. Text messages from Raider Nation <laughs> on the Raider Nation mailbag. You're listening to Silver and Black today. It's Mo, it's Scott. We're coming back right after these words. Welcome back, home stretch here on the Thursday edition, two days until June. I cannot believe it's already June on Silver and Black today in Odyssey Sports Original Podcast. If you don't already subscribe, Go wherever you get your audio, look for Silver and Black today and subscribe for us. If you're watching us on YouTube, thank you for being a part of the chat. And thank you as well for hitting the notifications bell and the subscribe button and a thumbs up will work for us as well. Mo Moten, Scott Branson with you. We are talking Raiders football and we get to talk to you guys this time. We bring in the phone calls. Slow week. Well, we didn't get a ton of phone calls this week. It's okay. It's understandable. There's not a lot going on, but we did get a couple and we got a couple text messages so we're going to start off mo with the first with a phone call uh but this guy keeps calling and saying he's got a package to deliver for you or something no i'm just kidding uh <laughs> i'm kidding folks relax you should have seen the chat the other night by the way on youtube i had people telling me that tommy eichenberg was going to beat out and this is for my buddy costas was going to beat out malcolm Coons on the outside i said well eichenberger's a mic he plays on the inside well, he's going to play on the I'm like he's never played outside. He's going to play on the inside. He's an inside linebacker. He's not real athletic. He can drop back in coverage, but he's not going to do that. So we have arguments in there, and I say arguments lovingly because we do. We disagree. We have a good time in there. So if you're in there with these phone calls too, we get a lot of comments on the phone calls. It's always fun. So yes, anyway, but that's where we go. He also swore to me, Mo, that there's no way Spillane will not be extended, and I said, hmm. So he wasn't real happy with what you were talking about, looking at linebackers next year. And I said, I remember when everybody told me that Josh Jacobs would be back. There's no way Antonio Pierce is going to let Josh Jacobs go, right? It's a business, man. You just never know. It's not that I want him to go. I'm just saying it's a business, and you laid out a case for it last show. I said this really quick, Scott. I said this on, on the X the other day that I understand why fans fall in love with players. There's an emotional sure. investment in it. You buy the jerseys. Sometimes you meet them after games, during the off season. I understand all of that. But when you look at things from a general manager perspective, you don't fall in love with players. You fall in mm -hmm. like, because any given year, you may get a trade offer. Oh, that guy's got to go. That guy may want a new contract that you're not willing to pay, i.e. Josh Jacobs. Oh, well. See you next guy up. That's what yeah. that's that, that's the GM mentality. And that's the mentality. And I think a caller said this uh, about some of the stuff that I put out that I, I approach this from a GM perspective. Correct. I don't approach it from a fan perspective. Oh, I love that guy. I, I don't know any of these players personally, by the way. They, they yeah. A lot of them seem like great guys, but I don't know them. So there for me, there's no emotional attachment to them. I'm looking at it from how do the Raiders get to the playoffs, how do they build a championship level, Super Bowl level team? And sometimes that's moving away from certain players that you like. Yeah. Or trading and, them. Well, and look, Robert Spillane, too, had a great year. No question. Nobody would ever take that away from him, but it's one year. So we'll have to see how he does this year. I think Eichenberg, too, he's not a he's not a for sure thing, by the way, there, but he is a guy who can play the same position should they decide to move on. If he performs well this year, because he, he's going to be a, a fill guy. He's not going to be the starter over Robert Spillane, but he'll be there. He'll play. And if he plays well enough, as a GM, you start to do it towards the end of the year. You look at your ledger and you say, yeah, he's a great player, but we got this guy. He's not far behind him. And we're going to get another guy. Again, the rookie contracts are the most valuable thing in the NFL. And it's unfortunate. I understand it, like you said, from a fan perspective, because you see a lot of guys that you like. And then you have to say goodbye to them because when the, the scale tips a little bit, a GM is going to go in the other direction because he's got other needs too as well. So there you go. But anyway, all right, let's get on to the call. This is uh, Mariachi 512. Here we go, Mariachi 512. Hello, this is Mariachi 512 out of Austin, Texas, Mariachi. Black Hole. 
I'm going to give you some reasons why we will get two or maybe three more wins this year. Ooh. First of all, our coach, Antonio Pierce, is going to be here for a full year. We're not under that other coach we had. <laughs> we also acquired a great defensive tackle, Christian Wilkins. It's going to improve our defense even more than it was last year. So it could be a top three defense next year. Our quarterback play will be better. We have a better offensive coach. We have a better offensive scheme, a more simple scheme. We also have more offensive weapons. Add Brock Powers to the equation. Yes, sir, we're going to support more points. Thank you. That's all I have to say. We will win two or three more games this year. Mark my words. Mariachi 512 out of Austin, Texas. All right. Mariachi 512, thanks for the call, man. We appreciate it coming out of Austin. I love it. I love Austin. I miss the breakfast Ma tacos. Yes, sir. Mariachi remembered it was a PG show, and he had to be careful what he said, how he, he described Josh McDaniels. He, he wanted yeah. to say something. He, he wanted to say something R-rated, and he was like, oh, oh PG show. Yeah, and man. he would have been justified in doing so. I will say that. I will say that. <laughs> be, uh, but he brought up a good point now. So he's basically saying t 10 or 11 wins. Now, yep. we talked about that, and I think he talked about a better offensive coach. That remains to be seen. I don't think you can say that based on what Luke Getze did in Chicago yet. We've talked a lot about that already. Number two is the key, quarterback play. He says we're going to have better quarterback play is what he said. I don't know if they will have better quarterback play. We'll have to see. Now, you would hope so. Aiden O'Connell in stretches last year was good, very good, and other stretches not so good. So we'll see if he gets consistency being a veteran now. And then you have Gardner Minshew, who we know can get into stretches where he's very good, and then he can get into stretches where he's not so good. So it all depends on that quarterback position to me because he mentioned all the offensive weapons. We talked about the, 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 the salary cap with wide receivers. If you can't get the ball to those weapons, it doesn't matter. So, so I'm not in any way telling you, Mariachi, to not be excited, not to be optimistic. I think your point of view as a fan, thinking two more wins, 10 wins, I think is a realistic expectation, right? Because you won eight last year, and now you're saying, hey, we got better in these spots. We should win a couple more games. I think that's a fair assessment if I'm a fan. Yes, and I'll get to what I say every year around this time. The Raiders <laughs> aren't the only team that gets better in the offseason. <laughs> They just it just doesn't happen that way. Uh all 32 teams have a draft. All 32 teams can sign players to free agency. So while the Raiders may get better, other teams have also got better. So you have to factor that in as well. And I will a couple of things I will, Mariachi, I will agree with you on a couple of things. One, the defense should be top notch. The Raiders were a top 10 scoring defense, I believe, ninth last year. They add Christian Wilkins, assuming that they address the cornerback position because that's my one concern about the defense is the cornerback position opposite Jack Jones. Assuming they address that, and I think they will, should be a top defense. What I will say about the offense is Luke Getzey admitted, and this was in The Athletic, Tashawn Reed had this piece, that he struggled to adjust to the opponent's game plan last year, and he struggled to tailor the offense to the skill set of his players. That concerns me. Now, he said he's learned from that experience. And he'll get better and he'll be better at it this time around. That remains to be seen. I won't yeah. say he's as bad as Josh McDaniels, but he's still in a prove it stage of his career as a play caller. We cannot really say how much better the offense is going to be with Luke Getz as the play caller if he just admitted that he struggled with some of the things that we criticized Josh McDaniels for last right. year over the last yeah. two years. So he's admitting to that, he's copying to that, but does he show improvement? That remains to be seen, and that's why I'm a little concerned about Luke Getze and his track record. The other part about the offense and the quarterback play in conjunction with the offense is, while we don't know what Luke Getze is as a play caller, you know, he's still growing in that role. I will say the offense should be a lot simpler compared to what Josh McDaniels ran, which you would assume you would get better results out of the players because – Simpler offense, better results, more optimal results. We will see. Michael Mayer commented on that. I think that part of it, there's something to it. You know, I, I would give the the nod to Mariachi on that one. <laughs> but as you said, and as I've been saying, you can have an offense with all of these play call, with all these playmakers. You can have a serviceable quarterback. But if your play calling quarterback don't mix well, 
you're going to have a problem. And I think we yeah. saw that, you know, the Raiders offense was better than it should have been, is better than it showed last year. And a lot of that goes to the play caller. And I think you could see a lot of those problems happening if Luke Getze doesn't adjust to his experiences in Chicago. Now, if he does, you have an offense that could be middle of the road, and that's good enough to get the Raiders to the playoffs with that defense that they have on the other side of the ball. And and, and just a trigger warning, because I'm going to defend Derek Carr for a second. But uh -oh. you remember that that year Derek Carr played for Josh McDaniels. He regressed, right, from the year previous. And mm -hmm. I think that was part of it because Derek Carr, you could say what you want about. I've always said he's a middle tier quarterback. He should have result. He should have had better results. But I think that yes, did he have his own failures? Of course he did. But the play calling, so it just underscores the point you're making, Mo, which is you can have all these guys, but if the play caller is not hitting all the right buttons, then you're not going to get an offense that is as productive as it should be. So, Really quick, Scott. Let's take the Philadelphia Eagles for an ex a prime example of this. The Philadelphia Eagles had Shane Steichen last year, went all the way to the Super Bowl. They lost to the Chiefs, yes. But they had a top offense, and they had a top defense. What happened in the following offseason? They lost their offensive coordinator, they lost their defensive coordinator, and they collapsed last year. But they mm -hmm. had mostly the same players. They had mostly the same core of guys on offense and defense. But the team looked totally different with two new coordinators. So, yes. again, you can have the talent, but those guys still have to be put in position, the best position to succeed and produce. And we'll see if Luke Getty can do that. We know Patrick Graham can do that on his side of the ball. Now it's Luke Getty's turn to prove that he can be a quality play caller in the NFL. Right. I don't think anybody's as concerned about the defense at this point. Uh, I mean, there's obviously things they need to shore up there, but offense is going to be what it's about. All eyes are going to be on Luke Getze, I think, from the very beginning of the season. All right. Thanks for your call, man. Now we're going to go to a text. And this is Tyler from Nipomo, California, which is just north. I want to say 45, maybe an hour north of Santa Barbara, California. And Tyler says, love the show, guys. I never miss an episode on Spotify. Tyler, thanks, man. I'm glad you listened to the show on Spotify Appreciate there. Uh, I had a question about our new OC. What a segue. Do you guys think he takes notes and ideas from his players and adjusts his scheme from there, or is he set in his ways? I feel like I, uh, I saw something about him being open to player ideas, but I wasn't sure. Anyways, keep up the good work, gentlemen, and never stray away from the dark side Raiders, he says. So that's <laughs> Tyler in Napomo, California. What about that, Mo? What, when we look at Luke Getze... What do we know from his time in Chicago on whether or not players have input and he's willing to mold his offense with some input, or is he kind of a my, my way or the highway kind of guy? Well, I was reading up on The Athletic, and these, and this is what he said. I'm not saying this. This is coming from Luke Getze. He said, there are certain things in your offensive system that are non-negotiable. He didn't say what those things were, but he said, there mm. are certain things that you, you're not going to change. It's a staple in your offense. But he said there's a certain there are certain things that you have to be willing to adjust to simply because different player skill sets, different guys in the lineup. One one receiver might be hurt and you may have to start a different receiver with a different skill set. You have to adjust to that. Right. So I think there's a mix between having your staple, having your staples in an offense and then being able to adjust to certain things within your offense to suit your players. I don't know whether he's going to you know have input from his players on what, you know, how to run his scheme or certain things to add or wrinkles to put in. But, but I'm pretty sure that he's going to lean on Devontae Adams, who he worked with in the in, with the Green Bay Packers. So Devontae Adams was a wide receiver. I believe he was a wide receiver coach, a pass game coordinator as well, also a quarterback's coach. I'm sure Devontae Adams being a leader in that locker room, having worked with Devontae Adams before, I'm sure Luke Getz is going to lean on him for input about, you know, what do you want to run? Like, what, you know, how can we, how can I help you? All right. That's the that's the old saying. Help me help you. And I think <laughs> Devontae Adams being that veteran, being an all pro, he's going to lean on him for for input. I absolutely believe that. Yeah. And I also think depending who wins the quarterback job, that's also going to dictate each quarterback has some strengths and you're going to play to those strengths. And so we'll have to see what happens there, too, because that'll open up the playbook or it'll narrow the playbook, depending on who it is. Uh, and also from your running game perspective, we, we know Zamir White, we know Alexander Madison, we know those guys are going to be there, how productive they're going to be and what they're able to do will depend that offensive line and that play calling. So we'll have to see how that ends up. But Tyler, uh, great, great text. We appreciate you. By the way, if you want to call us or text us, 
702-900-7869. That's 702-900-7869 to get on the Raider Nation mailbag. All right, we go to our buddy, Tarek. I'm calling him Traveling Tarek because he's always traveling on business, and he calls us from all kinds of locations. Where is Tarek today? We will see. Here we go. Good evening, Scott and Mo. This is Tarek oh, well. checking with you guys from Boston. Hope uh, you guys are well here for work. Just wanted to talk about uh, the, the last OTAs that took place. I think um, um, when it comes to Aiden O'Connell and Gardner Minshew, I mean, I think you can make a case for either one of them. Aiden O'Connell has the benefit of having played with uh, the, the current receivers minus Brock Bowers last year for an extended period of time. Gardner Minshew uh, started 13 games last year is a veteran and was voted a Pro Bowl alternate last year. One thing I do know is you can't keep switching. I know last season was different, but we went from Jimmy G to AOC to Hoyer back to AOC, and obviously it was a big mess. Um, so tell me what you guys think about that. I mean, again, you can make a case for either one, but I do think Aiden O'Connell appears to be in the driver's seat uh, to be the starting quarterback. Obviously, uh, that will really play out in training camp. Looks like the um, the offensive line is going to be uh, Miller, right tackle, JPJ, right guard. Uh, excuse me, left tackle, left guard, Andre James at center, Parham at right guard, and Thayer Munford at right tackle. I'm really curious to see what the running game is going to look like, considering we will be having a good offensive line. Uh, still question marks as to whether um, Zamir is going to be the long-term answer. I think uh, the camp is going to be extremely competitive. I think it's nice to see as far as the defensive side of the ball, Patrick Graham back. But I think um, guys like Hobbs, Belain, Diablo, uh, Trayvon Merrick, uh, those are good players. They're not great players, but hopefully when you have a bunch of guys who can collaborate and gel and mesh and play well together, then hopefully we'll have a top-tier defense. I'm excited to see what Jack Jones does with a full year under his belt with the Raiders. And um, I do think we're going to have the best single defensive front in football. I think we're going to be <laughs> extremely disruptive. So I uh, hope you guys have a good week. Happy Memorial Day, by the way. And I will talk to you guys later. Go Raiders. Bye-bye. There you go. Tarek calling us from Boston. Traveling Tarek, thanks for the call, man. Uh, you guys have a good point there, Mo, about the quarterbacks as we've been talking about them, which is I do agree with him there that, that you know, if, if a quarterback wins a starting job, you stick with him until he shows he cannot do the job for whatever reason or injury. God forbid. We don't want any injuries to anybody. But uh, to me, that I think you can't waffle, right? Even though Antonio Pierce is going to be in his first full season, I don't see him as that type of guy. You're going to go until you can absolutely exhaust the fact that either the quarterback's not working or he has to sit out for a certain reason. Uh, but but I, I don't see him doing that. I don't see that in his makeup as somebody who's going to go back start yeah i could see a guy getting pulled if he's having a bad game and somebody relieving him uh, but not relinquishing the starting role if you remember scott in that minnesota vikings game we were calling for and a lot of <laughs> fans were saying why don't you pull a o'connell and put in you know jimmy g see what he could do and he and and antonio pierce stood with a uh, and o'connell so i, I think you and Tarek are right about that. He's not going to flip flop. I still believe we could see both Aiden O'Connell and Minshew play, though. Yeah. Especially if Minshew wins the job, I could still. If Minshew has a bad couple of weeks, I could see him saying, "Okay, let's see what Aiden O'Connell has." He's more upside. If Aiden O'Connell starts Week One and he struggles and, and it looks like he's clearly a backup, I could see Minshew playing. You know, yeah. just because you you give yourself a chance to, you know, get to the playoffs if you correct or upgrade at a quarterback position or upgrade over a struggling quarterback early versus waiting too late to do it. What I do see, and I, and I hate to see this online, I see like little quarterback cults out there. So, <laughs> and I knew this was going to happen, Scott. I said this, I said this weeks ago, I said, with this battle, people are going to choose sides and say, I'm an Aiden O'Connell guy. I'm a Garner Minshew guy. And I, all I'm saying is if I'm a Raider fan, I'm saying, I'm a Raider guy. I want whoever to win the job. I want the best man to win the job. Right. I don't care if that's you root for both of them. I don't them. care. I root for both of them. I, I I don't care if it's Aiden. I don't care if it's Minshew. I don't care if Anthony Brown shows something and surprises the world and becomes a starter. Whoever it is, you want that quarterback to play at a high level. But I'm starting to see little quarterback camps and cults like, no, I'm an Aiden O'Connell guy. They talk down on, on Gardner Minshew or – I'm a Gardner Minshew guy, so I'm going to talk down on Aiden O'Connell, and I'm and it it it's mind-boggling because it's like 
Don't you want them both to look good? Because if they both look good, then you have two solid options regardless of who wins the job. And my point about this is that I, I'm not going to get into the whole quarterback beef discourse that goes on. I'm just going to say, and I wrote a piece on this on Sportsnet. I think this is exciting to see the best man win the job. Yes. Iron sharpens iron. Competition is good. I think it'll bring the best out of Minshew. I think it'll bring the best out of Aiden O'Connell as well. Right. And they, I, I said it earlier in relation to a different question, but they both have skill sets that are different from one another in some ways that strong in one way, strong. In another. But remember too, I want to say this because I'm with you. I'm not taking sides on anybody. I just want to see the battle and see who wins yeah. because whoever is picked to win had the best camp. And that's the way it should be. Guess what folks? The NFL is a meritocracy. It is based on that, not on who you like better. It's based on who plays better in the eyes of the coaches. We won't even know because we're not in practices. You said that a couple of shows ago. We're not in practice. We don't see it. So you may say, why are they starting in? Why are they start? doesn't matter. But again, people will make arguments over anything today. No, the sky's blue. No, it's a different shade of purple. It doesn't matter. People are going to argue about it. But I think as a Raider fan, if I'm a Raider fan, I'm excited. Like you said, I'm excited. These guys are going to go in. And that means they're going to compete their butts off. And when they come out, whoever it is, is going to have a really hot hand and look really good in camp. And you should feel good about going into that game against the Chargers in week one with whoever that is. And then you let the cards fall where they may through the course of the season. So great point you brought up. I appreciate that. And Tarek, thank you always for the call. We appreciate that. All right. Our last one of the day is a text. And it says, hey, guys, it's Raider Ali texting from Missouri. All right, so we're all over the country again. I hear something about the Raiders trading for Hendon Hooker. Just wanted to know if you know anything about it and your thoughts. I love that move for us. Hopefully it happens. That, again, is Raider Ali in Missouri. Ali, thanks for your first text. Please call in, text again. We appreciate it. Um, we talked about it, what, three or four weeks ago about Hendon Hooker? We did. It, it, but you know what's – thanks, Raider Ali, for sending that text and, and bringing up that suggestion. But I find it hilarious that we on our last show, people <laughs> were up in arms, upset that we even talked about the idea of the Raiders trading for Trey Lance. But in the same breath, some of those same people were like, well, what about Hendon Hooker? And I'm like, uh, you know, it, it's it, to me, I look at it like this. If we put Trey Lance and Hendon Hooker in a similar category, it's about acquiring a, a young quarterback with upside. The idea is to say that's the common thread between both of them. Whether regardless of what you feel about Trey Lance and what he could be, regardless of what you feel about Hendon Hooker, what he could be, the idea is to get a young quarterback who's underdeveloped, who may have a potential future as a starter. You just don't know until he, he gets on the field and plays. Okay. Now Trey Lance, let's remember Trey Lance played had you know he was in lighting the world on fire, so to speak. But he he had some decent starts before he got hurt with the San Francisco 49ers. Let's remember that's why he initially lost his job. He got hurt. He had a yeah. season-ending injury. So the 49ers were willing to develop him. Just so happened that they they lucked into Brock Purdy. I won't say luck, but they drafted Brock Purdy, and he became what he is today, uh, the trigger man for our top offense and the Super Bowl caliber football team. So to get to Raider Ali's comment question, you know, I, I wouldn't mind if the Raiders were to acquire Hendon Hooker. I haven't heard or seen any official reports about that. But I wouldn't mind if they kicked the tires on a young quarterback with upside because that's the idea. Until the Raiders, and I posted this on X, until the Raiders identify who their franchise quarterback is, you bring in guys and continue to evaluate them. Now, some people will say, why would you bring in a young guy like Hendon Hooker or Trey Lance while you're trying to evaluate uh, Aiden O'Connell? And my point was you could do both at the same time. You could start <laughs> Aiden O'Connell and still evaluate Trey Lance or Hendon Hooker behind the scenes. You just said it a, a few minutes ago that a lot of times these evaluations come down come down to what these players do at practice. We don't see all these practices, and we wonder why certain guys are starting. is because they showed out at practice, and you're hoping that translates to a real game. So you can have Aiden O'Connell start the majority of the 2024 season and still evaluate Trey Lance or Hendon Hooker at practice. And if Aiden O'Connell isn't the guy, then you say, okay, we like what we saw out of Hendon Hooker. We like what we saw out of Trey Lance. Let's give them a shot and see what they got. Yeah, and by the way, Trey Lance was 2 and 2 as a starter. He won 2 games at home, 2 and 0 as a 49er at home and he lost 2 on the road. Now, I didn't I didn't look into the stats of that. I'm just saying though that that's not very that's very rookie like. 
to win games at home and then on the road you kind of crumble that's we, we see that all the time he's played in eight games total so the interesting thing with trey lance is i just look at him versus hendon hooker and i say okay you like Hendon Hooker, why? Hendon Hooker looked good in college. I liked him. We talked about him that draft year two years ago. Um, but he's coming off a knee injury. He's not played in an NFL game. So it, 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 that amazes me, too, is that somehow because he's Hendon Hooker and he's never played in a game, he's going to be a better gamble, because that's what it is, than a Trey Lance, which actually Trey Lance would come a lot cheaper than Hendon Hooker, in my view, if you traded for him. Maybe. We'll see. But anyway, good good question, Ali. I think that they'll, they'll explore quarterbacks where they will. I would not, if I was looking for a franchise quarterback, uh, I look at Trey Lance. He's only he's on the last year of his contract. So if you were to somehow trade for him next year uh, or this year or whatever, then you have an opportunity to look at him and you're not on the hook for more money after that where Hendon Hooker is on his rookie deal, even if it's a lower rookie deal. Scott, I will say this, and this goes for any young quarterback who's underdeveloped or has some upside. I'm in favor of the Raiders bringing in any, any young quarterback who, who could be a potential starter. And again, until they find their franchise guy, it's, this is not about Trey Lance. This is not about Hendon hooker. This is not about hating Aiden O'Connell. This is not about hating Gardner Minshew, but until you find that guy, I'm continuously bringing in quarterbacks. Yeah. You see, you Turnstile. see teams with you. You see what you see. Even teams with their quarterback position set bring in young developmental guys. The Philadelphia Eagles just acquired Kenny Pickett, who yeah. was a first round pick not too long ago. I mean, yeah. the, the Rams had Matthew Stafford take them to a Super Bowl. They drafted Stenson Bennett. The New Orleans right. Saints acquired Derek Carr, gave him a no trade clause. They've drafted quarterbacks. And back-to-back -back seasons after you know after acquiring him, so you see this all the time. The Cleveland Browns gave Deshaun Watson a, a, a fully guaranteed two hundred thirty million dollar contract. You know what they did? They drafted a quarterback in the fifth round. You know what they did this past off season? I know Deshaun Watson hasn't played that well. They acquired Jameis Winston. You know, yeah. so teams even with their quarterback position set are continuously evaluating young guys because you just never know what's going to happen in today's NFL. You could be at the top of the mountain one season and you can fall off that mountain in the, in the following season. It happens every year. Absolutely. And you look at Geno Smith right now, Geno Smith out of nowhere comes two years ago in Seattle, has a great year, gets his big contract. And last year was iffy, right? But still it's a good example of, and, and the, the Raider examples. I mean, Jim Plunkett's the best example of all. Here's a guy who was highly touted. Nobody wanted him. He goes to New England. They he doesn't work there. He goes to San Francisco. Doesn't work there. Then he goes to Oakland and he wins two. He wins two. Uh, Elkin and L.A. actually and wins two Super Bowls. Right. So so you never know, and that's why you take a risk on those guys. If they're a high draft pick, what's it going? It's going to cost you a little money, and that's it. Uh, maybe a, a lower draft pick. So so we'll see whether it's Hendon Hooker, whether it's Trey Lance, whether it's somebody else. We'll see what happens. And there's a bunch of those guys this year, too. We talked about Zach Wilson. We talked about these guys. I know everybody thinks they suck, but you never know. You get into a new place, the right coast, right situation, and suddenly things can turn around. Very interesting with that. And, and Scott, really quick, how many teams started multiple quarterbacks last season? <laughs> the most ever. Almost, we, we saw the, a record number of backups play. So yeah. just you know, just because you you love your starter or believe in your starter doesn't mean you, you don't try to improve the quarterback room in any way possible because – the, you know, the, the league rules have an emergency third quarterback for a reason. You know, exactly. a longer season, especially with these injuries, you want to stock up on quarterbacks. You want to have the best quarterback room possible, even if it's the number two or number three guy. Yeah, a lot of teams now, too, going with four quarterbacks. Of course, one's on the practice squad. They can be activated in another week if you have an injury, but because you can have three quarterbacks ready to go. So interesting stuff. All right, Ray Ali, appreciate it. It's going to wrap up this edition of Silver and Black today. We appreciate you guys being with us. Mo, let everybody else know what's going on with you this week at Bleacher Report, at Sports Knot, whatever you may be doing. Well, shout out to everyone who joined the show over on Bleacher Report on Wednesday. Ray Gilly was a main person, part of that show. <laughs> I, I like to make that show about the fans as much as it is about me. So if you know, if I ever have a Bleach Report show going on and I post it out, please join because you'll be a part of that show with your questions and comments. I won't have another Bleach Report show until June 14th, though, so another two weeks until that happens. But over on Sports Now, I'll still be active. I have a piece out today on positions the Raiders should address post-June 1. So as a lot of people know, guys are going to get cut or moved 
uh, post June one and teams can capitalize on that. And there are three positions in particular. I think the Raiders can add some talent for competition or a guy who could potentially start week one of the season. That'll be up on, that is up on sports. Not other than that, Scott, I'm going to go into a dark retreat. <laughs> I'm going to fall off the radar. I'm going to fall off the earth and no one will hear from me for quite some time. That's okay. <laughs> just, just be careful doing it. Uh, yeah, no, that's totally understandable and I get it and I appreciate it. And thanks for having a bleacher report live on my wedding anniversary. I appreciate that very much. Um, Congratulations, Scott. We'll go out to dinner and we'll watch Mo's live <laughs> for our anniversary. It'll be so romantic on the screen. Fourteen. Huh? <laughs> I love it. Flag day, baby. Yeah, we were married yeah. on flag day. Yeah. Gotta love it. Nice. All right. I appreciate you, my man. All right. Um, do us a favor. Make sure you subscribe to the podcast wherever you get your audio. Also, if you're watching us on YouTube, thanks for making it to the end of the show. So many of you do, which makes us feel great. That means you're engaged. You're having fun in the chat. That's awesome. Make sure you hit the subscribe and the notifications bell. By the way, Mo, we've had a bunch of people, or there's a guy, and I forgot. I'm going to call him out, so excuse me for not calling you out. Uh, I'm on my different set here, so I got my stuff on the other side. But I will will name you next time. But a guy comes in and buys memberships, which allow people to do. So we're going to do – we're starting to get these memberships, Mo, where – and I forgot what the gentleman's name, but he's bought a lot of our listeners who are watching on YouTube m memberships. So their chats always go to the top of the thing. And then we can do member-only shows. So as soon as we get to a certain number, we're going to start uh -huh. doing uh, – every once in a while, do some short uh, – uh, Q and A shows with our members, in addition to the rest of the folks too. So stay tuned for that. We thank you for that. Just amazing stuff. We love our listeners and viewers. You guys are awesome. Even when we disagree, we have so much fun with you. So thank you for that. All right, and thanks to our producer at Odyssey Sports, Mike Robbie, for doing all that he does. For Mo Moten, I am Scott Colbranson. We'll be back next week here on Silver and Black today. Take care, everyone. <laughs>